of Nutzia Daf Mem Zayin on the bed skin in the game to Knu Mishum She'enam Ruganim. The shir is dedicated in memory of the Ilu Nishma to Dina Oraya Bat Moshe the Yehudis. May her family be comforted. I feel that I can't start the shir without acknowledging uh, a night of miracles, without thanking the Rebbeinu Shalom, acknowledging Hashem for for a night of of Nisim. And it's really important when it comes to Nisim to never, never, never forget how you were feeling at 11 o'clock last night, at 12 o'clock last night. Because miracles have a funny habit of flattening out over time. When you look back, uh, it wasn't, wasn't such a miracle. Even with Kriyas Yamsuf, it was the wind and it was the currents and it was this. It, one explains miracles away. Very, very quickly, people explain miracles away. We're so intent on being able to explain everything and to have reasons for everything that we explain the miracles away. And I just hope and pray that, that we in, in Israel and Jews in the, throughout the world don't become arrogant and complacent and recognize what, what happened last night. And the only way you can recognize what happened last night is by reliving the feelings of fear that we had at 11 and 12 o'clock last night, knowing that hundreds of missiles were on their way to us. They were irretractable. They couldn't be turned back anymore. There was no negotiating, no discussion. They were, they were on the way. We learned in, in Bovakama, Isho Mishum Chitza, that once you shoot an arrow, once you've lit in the fire, it's done, it's gone. You, you can't pull that back anymore. It's a different kind of a, of a mazik. And there we were with these hundreds of rockets. And these weren't Hamas rockets from Gaza. These were exceptionally, are exceptionally sophisticated instruments of war with very sharp navigational capabilities. And we knew that, and the world knew that. And after hundreds of these rockets are fired at us, they're fired with accuracy that not a single Jew was scratched or their property in any way damaged. A little bit of damage in one of the army bases, very superficial. As far as we know, maybe other reports will come in. But right now, as we stand now, it's sad that, that six Jordanians were killed and, and that a Bedouin girl is, is seriously ill. It's sad. But the miracle that not one Jewish person or owner of property was damaged out of those hundreds of rockets, that the allies who had forsaken us a few days before got together so quickly, Jordan, that Jordan shot some of the rockets that were fired at Israel. Tell me, is that not a miracle? If I would have told you a week ago, never mind 10 years ago, Jordan will shoot down rockets fired at Israel. Who would have believed such a thing? That those same allies who were dropping us a few days ago rallied so quickly to help and to support, and that with such sophistication and accuracy, every single one of those those rockets, I, I don't know if you you were watching, I, I was just glued to the screen, but to watch the Harabait there with these rockets raining down on them and just, it was like biblical proportions. You're looking at that. It's something I'll certainly never forget for, for the rest of my life, but what worries me is that we forget what we felt like earlier in the evening. I don't know about you. I, I was scared. Yes, I had been talking and I felt it will be fine and everything will be okay. But there's that unknown. Where is it going to hit? What's it going to hit? Are they going to go for the electricity system? Are they going to go for oil storage tanks? Are they going to go? Who knows where? what they're going to go for? And they can aim what that could be. And only if we recognize that. And that's why so much of Pesach and so much of the Seder is about the avdus, not just about the cheros. It's about the slavery, not just the freedom. That's the whole point of Manishtana. Manishtana is, are we celebrating freedom or are we celebrating slavery? Are we commemorating slavery or celebrating freedom? We dip and we lean, and yet we eat matzah and we eat marrow. That there are signs of freedom, there are signs of, of slavery. And what is the answer to the, to the four questions? The important thing is the transition from Avdus to Cheres. It's not about Cheres, and it's not about Avdus. It's not about slavery, and it's not about freedom. It's about the moment of transition, because that's the moment of miracle. And the danger is that after the miracle is over, you look in your rearview mirror, and you explain the miracle away. And then you've lost everything. 
So we're given Pesach, not just to remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim, or to, rem- to remember the transition, remember what it was like to be in Mitzrayim, and then remind yourself of what it was like to come out. Because you can't remember the miracle of coming out. You can't relive the miracle of coming out if you haven't also lived the, the, the misery of being in, in that situation. And so it, it, it's really important for us to be able to draw on this at any time in the future when you have a low in emuna, when you, your levels of faith are, 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 are in a dip, or one's worried and one is scared, just remember last night. Just remember what it was like at 11 o'clock last night, at 12, as I said, I didn't, I didn't go to sleep. I just, I just couldn't take my eyes off history unfolding with, with miracles in front of us. It was just, it was just so gripping. And so beautiful to, to be able to see, to feel the Rebbein Shalom's protective hand over us as all of this was happening. Just an, an amazing moment. What a privilege to, to have been here. Of course, we're still in the middle of it. We don't know how this is going to play out and what's next and what will happen. I'm, I'm just talking about last night. Uh, it was worth coming on Aliyah just for last night. Just to experience that was worth it because that's something one can draw on for the rest of our lives. So you'll see, because I was doing other things last night, the, uh, there are not a lot of Makotas, there's just Gemara Rashi Tosfus. But Gemara Rashi Tosfus is all we really need to be able to understand an important principle of how by giving somebody skin in the game, giving them skin in the outcome, you gain so much more than you concede. You gain so much more than you lose. People sometimes like to try and get every last penny for themselves. But sometimes by giving away, by giving somebody else an interest in the outcome of a deal or the outcome of a piece of work that they're doing, by giving them generously a piece of the action, you gain much more than you, than you lose. Let's see that in the Gemara. Homer Rabbi Yochanan, this question we've been dealing with in, in Hazahav so far as to whether when you're transacting with metaltalin, you're using movable properties, so our famous gold Rolex is being sold, what constitutes the Kenyan, and in our last year on Daf Mem Dalad, we talked about the importance of the Kenyan in this. What is the moment of transaction? Is it the handing over the money, or is it when you hold the gold Rolex in your hand? What is the point? Om Rabbi Yochanan, Devar Torah, Ma'ot Konot. Mida Oraisa, the way the Torah has it, money works for Metaltali. Um Ipnei Ma'am Remeshich HaKoyne. So why, does the, why did the Chachomim say, but we're not allowing money to be the determinant of the transaction? We want you to actually hold the Rolex in your hand that you've bought, not just to, to pay for it. So if you've paid for it, but the seller still has the watch, you go to the jeweler, you, you, you pay for the gold Rolex, and, and you say, you'll carry, the, the jeweler says he wants to fix it up for you, he wants to wrap it up, and then come tomorrow and fetch it. So for the next 24 hours, he's got the money and he's got the Rolex. Who does the Rolex belong to at that time? So the Chachalim said, no, it still belongs to the jeweler. It doesn't belong to you yet, even though you've paid for it, until you've held it in your hand. What we're worried about is, if we say the deal is done, we're worried that the Iranians could shoot us a rocket, it could land on the jeweler, your golden Rolex could be, could be caught up in it all, and he would do nothing to try and save it, because it's yours, it's not his, he's already delivered it. So we say, no, it's not delivered until it's delivered. You've actually got to deliver it. So so the Gemara goes on to discuss, we we won't go into that. If you leave this in the ownership of the seller, with Mesiris Nefesh, he will dedicate himself and put energy into going to save the object which is at risk. So the Gemara goes on, and there, there are various pieces of this Gemara. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Kol Shia Kesef Biyado Yado Ala Eliona. The person who's holding the money and the object, in the case we're discussing the jeweler who's got the payment and the Rolex, he's the one who can back out. The buyer can't come back and say, you know what, I know I paid for it, but I haven't done Meshicha yet, I haven't lifted up, I haven't taken possession of the Rolex yet, I want to change my mind. I, I actually want my money back, and I don't want to go ahead with the deal. Says Rabbi Shimon, he can't do that. Only the seller can do that. That works if you hold like Rabbi Yochanan says, and not like Reish Lakish says. Reish Lakish says, no, the Torah says money doesn't work. There's got to be, you've got to take physical delivery. If you learn like Rabbi Yochanan that 
technically money works. It's the Rabbonin who said that you've got to take physical delivery. Mishum hachi moche matzi hadrabe. That makes sense as to why the seller can change his mind. And the lokeach cannot change his mind. We need one more piece of Gomorrah and then we can uh, analyze the Rabbi Shimon a bit more. We learned in a bright, and this, this piece of Gomorrah we'll do more tomorrow because it goes into tomorrow's page as well. Aval amru misha parami, dora mabul hu atidli parami misha eno made bidiburo. It's all true that the Kenyan isn't there. You've paid for the Rolex and now the seller just gets a notice from the Rolex company that the price has gone up. And this day and now, if he sells the Rolex again today, he can get a much higher price for it. So he wants to pull out. Well, technically he can, because money doesn't conclude the Kenyan. There hasn't been Mashiach. But there's a Misha para, that means Hashem, there's a, a curse. That Hashem who extracted punishment from the generation of the flood and others will extract punishment from him as well. And the Gemara goes on to discuss that. Let's go back now to Rabbi Shimon. I amrit bishna ma'adeva Torah ma'ot konot, says Rashi. Kanta de Rabbonin, he? So, so, I understand Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon who says only the seller, in this case the jeweler, can back out of the deal but not the buyer of the Rolex. Why? Because even though from the Torah paying for, them, for it is already the conclusion of the transaction, mid Rabbonin there's got to be delivery. At Rabbi Shimon so I understand Rabbi Shimon comes to say it's enough if the, if the seller has the right to back out. Why? Since you've given him the right to change his mind if the price goes up. So you're making a concession. Technically, he can't change his mind. Technically, once the money has been paid, you've gone into the jeweler, you've paid the money, you haven't yet taken delivery. Technically, according to the Torah, the Rolex is yours. The Chachomim say, ah, let the Rolex still be his. But that means that he has a right to back out. If the price of gold goes up and the price of the Rolex goes up, he could back out of it. That's true. But by doing so, he will put in effort to take good care of the Rolex in the time that he's got it before he gives you delivery. Even if the rocket hits his jeweler's store, he will still go out of his way to save the Rolex. Meimer Omer, he will say to himself, Adain talui bahem, talui bahem. I've still, I could still make money out of this. It's true, somebody's bought it already, but I could cancel the deal and I can maybe sell it for more if I can find a buyer who will pay more. Shim yitiakru achzorbo. Asks Tosfus. Tosfus brings Rashi. And Tosfus asks, V'im tomar v'chi tiknu m'shicha b'shvil she'ena m'huganim? Did, are we creating a Kenyan here? We're doing away with the Torah's Kenyan of Kesef, of money, and we're introducing the Kenyan of Meshichai. There needs to be delivery, physical delivery, for people who are not right, who are not straight, for people who, who, are, not, who are not honest. Is that, do we make laws for people who are not honest? What we're doing is we're encouraging to pull out of the deal if the price goes up. We're actually facilitating that. And if he does pull out of the deal, he's got a Misha para, he's got a Klal, he's got a curse. And we, we the Chachomim, are saying, it's okay, so you'll get the curse, but you can get, at least you can get more money for it. We're actually enabling him to pull out of a deal that he's made and to be, uh, and to qualify for the curse of a Misha para. Why would we be doing that? Shetzadikim lo yachzuru lo alama, filuim yokiru. At Sadik will never back out of a deal, no matter how the price changes. That's not what a tzaddik does. A word is a word, and that's how it is. Says Tzadik, they really did. I make the takona for she'enam behuganim, for people who are not straight. Because otherwise, the rocket hits the jewelry shop, and he's not going to bother to save the, the, the Rolex and run out with, with the Rolex in his hand, he'll leave it in the shop because he's got nothing to lose. He has no skin in the game. The obvious question with Tosfus is, Tosfus answers, would they make him? Would they make a takana for people who are not straight? And Tosfus answers, yes, they made a takana for people who are not straight. What, what, what was the original idea? What, what was Tosfus surprised about? And what's the answer? What changes here? What changes is it would appear that the, what Tosfus is saying in the answer, it's not that they made a takana to enable him to back out. That's not the sense. They made the takana to give him a sense of ownership. It's still yours. You still have responsibilities. 
And that means, yes, you could still make more money, theoretically. If you want to break your word, you still could, because it's yours. Yes, you've got an ethical responsibility to the buyer, but the Rolex is yours. And if you want to make more money on it, you could. That understanding that it's mine, even though I shouldn't back out of the deal, and it's wrong to back out of the deal, merely knowing that it's mine and that technically I could back out of the deal, that enables me she, she, that I won't be menir perot chavarehim l'israel. I'll use ownership, I'll take more responsibility for it, I'll care for it more because I have an interest in this. I have skin in the game, I have an interest in this. So we see from Rabbi Shimon the way Tosfus learns, learns Rabbi Shimon this idea that technically something belongs to a particular individual, they have a right to it. But at times, by giving them a little more, by conceding, even if he's a rogue, even if you don't like him, giving him a little bit of skin in the game, giving him some interest, giving him a commission, giving him a percentage of the profits, giving him some way of having an interest in an outcome, it's just human nature. It, it gives the person a much higher sense of responsibility and ownership, and the result of that is that they, the individual is willing to do things in order to sustain, to retain, to preserve the object that he would not otherwise be willing to do.